Draco Malfoy and the Letter from the Future. My Draco will hear about this. Chapter 8. Slytherin Loyalty. It's cruel. Harry muttered, sounding relieved, but Draco grabbed his arm and shook his head at him. What? hissed Harry, frowning. Don't trust him! Draco breathed. He caught Hermione's eye over Harry's shoulder, and she nodded once. Quirrell stuttered as he approached them, shuddering as he took a look around the dark ward. What are you d d doing down here? How did you know we were here? Drago demanded rather bravely, he thought. It was as if the need to protect Harry was giving him the courage he had been missing before. P -p 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 Professor M -m -m McGonagall found you m -m 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 missing, Coral explained haltingly. She, she sent me? She would have come down herself. Drago narrowed his eyes, staring at Coral hard. He ordered himself to show no fear. You're here because of the stone, aren't you? Coral stopped quivering at his words, and a slow smile spread across his face. Very good, Mr. Malfoy, he praised, amused. You are your father's son after all. I did not think you had it in you. I'm nothing like him, Draco sneered. We won't let you get to the stone. We learned in Dumbledore, and he's on his way. He's lying, a high voice hissed in rather breathy tones. Draco's eyes widened, and he looked around frantically. The others did, too. The voice had not come from Quirrell. You're clever, Malfoy, Quirrell smiled, but not clever enough. You, like your head of house, might have seen through me, but none of you has it in you to stop me. Now tell me, where is the stone? It was Hermione who answered, but her voice was trembling and weak. We, we haven't yet. We were just... But... The second disembodied voice breathed, making Draco shudder. The Potter boy has it. Quirrell's eyes zoomed in on Harry, who was still looking at Quirrell in shock. Mr. Potter? Quirrell smiled, stretching out his hand, palm up, waiting. If you'd please. Never. Harry spat, shaking his head. You'll have to kill me. Draco refrained from groaning in despair and won't Harry not give the other man ideas. Let me speak to him. The disembodied voice instructed and Draco took a shaky breath, looking around once more for the source of the voice. There was none. Face to face. Master, you're not strong enough. Coral muttered his eyes, unseeing as if he was talking to himself. It dawned on Draco then. He eyed the turban, and panic came rushing to his ears. They had to get out of here. Now! I have strength enough for this, the voice said, and Quirrell, obeying, reached up to untie his turban. It seemed like both Riesley and Draco had the same idea at the same time. But you forget so talentless! Welcome on a Wibbly! Drago pulled at Harry's arm the moment he had fired the spell, trying to get the frozen boy to move. Next to Harry, he saw Weasley reach for Hermione, but they did not come far. Quirrell deflected their spells wandlessly, and with another wave of his head, he procured flames behind him, blocking their way. Draco yelped, and Hermione shrieked. Weasley cursed under his breath. Quirrell, though, was still smiling as he let the turban fall to the floor and turned around. Both Draco and Hermione screamed. Harry's hand flew to his forehead, and he let out a pained gasp. A face was staring at them from the back of Quirrell's head, and it had glinting red eyes and slits where a nose should have been. Harry Potter, it said. Harry, his hand still pressed to his forehead, seemed still frozen, unable to move. He stared up at the face in horror. See what I have become. Mere shadow. It kept talking, but Draco could not hear what it said. There was a rushing panic dulling his ears once more, and it seemed to overwhelm him. The Dark Lord. This was the Dark Lord, and he was going to kill them! He was going to be forced to watch his friends die, watch Harry die, and then die himself! And there was nothing he could do, nothing at all! The rushing sound only dampened slightly when Harry stumbled backward, breaking Draco's grasp on his arm. It was like a bucket of cold water in Draco's face! Don't be a fool, said the thing that was the Dark Lord. Better save your own life and join me, or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. Liar! 
Harry shouted. How touching, the Dark Lord hissed. Draco desperately tried to catch the eyes of Hermione, of Weasley, but both seemed stunned, just staring up at the Dark Lord's face in horror. They had to do something. Draco wanted to scream at them. Never! Harry yelled at something the Dark Lord had said, and Draco, out of options, sent the full body behind the girl's back. He grabbed Harry once more and ran towards the fire. Maybe he could cast an Aguamenti at it, he thought. Furiously, but as they tried to run past Quirrell, the man, having repelled the hex once more, seized Harry's arm. Harry screamed in pain and struggled, and Draco pulled at him, but quite suddenly Quirrell let go of Harry, yelling in pain himself. Draco looked around wildly, seeing that Quirrell was cradling his fingers, gasping. Both Hermione and Weasley sent their own hexes at Quirrell, but with a wave of his hand, they were suddenly thrown backwards. They hit the stone wall hard and crumbled to the floor, unmoving. No! Harry yelled, Seize him! Seize him! The Dark Lord called. Quirrell jumped at Harry, knocking him off his feet. Drago, in an instant, grasped Quirrell by the shoulders and pulled, trying to get him off his friend. He could not follow what was happening. Quirrell was yelling, and so was the Dark Lord, and then there was a shout of pain. Harry had grabbed Quirrell's face and was pressing his fingers into it with an expression of fevered determination. There was more screaming, and then Quirrell rolled off him, weeping in pain. Harry, his own face screwed up in pain, too, rolled after him, continuing to reach for Quirrell's face, which Draco now saw was blistering as if burned. Burned. All the while, the Dark Lord was shouting at Quirrell to just kill Harry, and suddenly everything was still. Both Harry and Quirrell had collapsed on the floor, and Draco fell to his knees to pull Harry away. He shook his shoulders, panicked. Harry! he called. Wake up! You can't be dead! Wake up! Over his fear, Draco did not notice the vapor rising from Quirrell's still body. It formed an indistinct shape, and then, just as Draco looked up, it lurched at him. Draco screamed and everything went black. When Draco woke, he was in the hospital wing. He felt sluggish, and it took a moment for him to regain memory of what had happened. When he did, he sat up so quickly that the world was spinning around him. It was dark, and the only source of light was the half-closed door to Madame Pomfrey's office. Draco could hear voices from it, but he couldn't focus enough to identify them. Instead, he looked around, searching, Hermione was in the bed next to him, her eyes closed, her breathing even. Two other beds were occupied on the other side of the infirmary, but it was too dark for Draco to make out the faces of the people lying in them. Draco threw his blanket back and got to his feet shakily. He felt dizzy, but he needed to make sure Harry was here, that he was alive. He stumbled across the room and almost fell, but he caught himself at the foot of what turned out to be Weasley's bed. He, too, was fast asleep, unaware of Draco's presence. The other bed held a mob of unruly dark hair, almost hiding the scar on its occupant's forehead. The dingy glasses lay on the bedside table. Drago breathed in deeply, and his legs gave out underneath him. He sank to the floor, and the noise seemed to alert the people in the office, for the voices ceased very suddenly. The door opened fully, and Madame Pomfrey peeked into the room. Mr. Malfoy? She hissed the project amid fast steps. What are you doing out of bed? Harry, Draco muttered weakly, Mr. Potter will be fine, she informed him in a low voice, heaving him to his feet and half carrying him back to his bed. And so will be Mr. Weasley and Miss Granger. There is nothing to worry about. You need to rest. But, Draco got out with some difficulty, Coral, the stone. There is no need to worry, Draco, said another soft voice, making Draco look over the school nurse's shoulder. There, in the darkness, stood Professor Dumbledore, looking down at him with a kind expression. Professor Quirrell won't be able to harm anyone in the future, and the stone is safe. But, Draco muttered, feeling his strength leave him as he spoke, the Dark Lord has gone back into hiding. Dumbledore smiled. You and your friends are safe. Please make sure to rest. You need it. I will explain everything in due time. Drago wanted to say something more, but his eyes fell closed, and he was gone. Drago, Hermione, and Weasley were released from the hospital wing the very next day, but it took Harry three days to wake up. They spent as much time at his bedside as Madame Pomfrey would allow. When he did end up waking, though, they had been down at Hagrid's. 
Dumbledore had been there, though, and he had filled Harry in about everything that had happened, which was, in the end, how they acquired the missing pieces of information. That Coral had died by Harry's hands, a side effect of the protection his mother had left on him when she had sacrificed her own life for his. That the stone had been destroyed. That Snape's dislike for Harry stirred from an old schoolboy rivalry with Harry's father, but that, despite their suspicions, he had tried to protect Harry all year. Draco could have cared less about the explanation, though. He was just relieved that his best friend was well and out of danger. Harry was released in time for the end-of-year feast in which Gryffindor, quite unsurprisingly, ended up winning the House Cup. What was a surprise, though, was that all four of them received 50 points each for the houses. Weasley for the best-played game of chess Hogwarts has seen in many years, Hermione for the use of cool knowledge in the face of fire, Harry for pure nerve and outstanding courage, and Draco for unwavering loyalty in the face of great danger. Draco, in a moment of silence, had been agonizing about his own uselessness during those many, many tasks. Hermione had brought them past the devil's snare and Snape's riddle. Weasley had won the chess match for them and knocked out the troll. Harry had caught the key and gotten the stone. What had Draco done, apart from cowering in fear and putting together that Quirrell was the one after the stone about a moment before they happened upon him? Loyalty, he thought, resisting the urge to snort to himself as Draco announced his doubtful forte to the rest of the school. When had he become such a Hufflepuff? They call Hufflepuff students loyal in lack of any other useful treats. His father had always scoffed, and Draco had believed it. What could you buy yourself from loyalty? But as Harry had met his eyes, smiling brightly and cheering louder than any Slytherin had, he thought that maybe if loyalty was what had brought Harry out of there alive, he could live with being known for it. It turned out not to be his own quality. When exam results were announced, Draco ended up second best of the year right after Hermione. Harry passed with good marks too, and even Weasley came out above average. On the way back to London, Harry was about as subdued as Draco. Both dreaded the prospect of going home, though Draco conceded he at least had his mother on his side. Harry had no one. Draco had not heard much about Harry's muggle relatives, but he knew enough to realize that Harry was not wanted there, and it made Draco feel slightly nauseous that his best friend would have to spend two months in their midst. He wished he could have offered him to stay at the manor, the way Weasley had promised to invite him to the burrow. But even if his father had allowed it, Draco knew that Harry would rather stay with the Muggles than come to his house. Draco couldn't blame him. His only consolation was the owls they were sure to exchange, both stuck in places they did not want to be, isolated from all of their friends. Only Draco's mother was waiting for him at the platform, which was a relief. He took his time saying his goodbyes to Harry and Hermione, and exchanged a cordial nod with Weasley, before strolling over to her. She smiled and bent down to kiss his cheek. "'Welcome back, darling,' she said. "'Did you have a nice time?' "'Mostly,' Draco shrugged, and his mother raised an amused eyebrow. "'I guess you heard about your little adventure,' she quipped, humming. "'Let's just say your father broke a vase when he received the letter.' "'A nice one?' Draco inquired, because he had nothing else to say. No, a horrid family heirloom from Grandfather Abraxas, she shuddered. I was looking for an excuse to get rid of it for years. Well, Draco smirked. You're welcome. She rolled her eyes, but she was smiling as she put a hand on his shoulder and led him towards the exit. Draco threw a look at Harry, who was chatting with Miss Weasley. His friend looked up as if feeling Draco's eyes on him and smiled, waving. Draco waved back, and Aquila made a hooting sound from his cage. End of Draco and the Letter from the Future. Where Draco will hear about this. If you enjoyed this recording or the content, feel free to leave a comment below or a review at the original story from the link in the description. Thank you for listening, and please be on the lookout for other stories in this series.